fun is for me. Uh, it's not something that is in you. It's not the experience of pleasure. It's the result of having having worked with some part of the world in a way that something so it's like the like access central. Like they like a Korean wrote a really great piece about this some years back about how like they're like the, so the king let's take hands up for a bit and then down just to get your get your kind of uh, circulation going on. <laughs> and for me, when you think about uh, video games, video game developers have been telling interactive stories for decades. So why not combine the creative side of things with some of the best stories on Most the Most commercial media uh, are thinking that advertising is sort of on its way out in the same way perhaps that print is on its way out. It's not. Welcome to our panel on Web3, blockchain, crypto, metaverse. Um, I was just thinking, I'm so old now that I remember chairing these panels when I was younger and more in demand. Um, to talk about what impact will the internet have on journalism? What impact will social media have on journalism? What impact will mobile telephony have on journalism? Um, but I also chaired panels uh, about what impact will, apologies to Richard Gingras, Google Wave have on journalism. So, you know, this is a great forum where we discuss what is the moving body of water that's really, really going to change everything and not just for us in journalism, but for everybody. And what are the kind of things that we can pretty safely ignore um, until, until it's actually proven that um, a real-time social app for people dancing in their pajamas is in fact the future of news <laughs> and we kind of missed that one two years ago and we have to catch up. Um, I've got such a great panel to discuss this with. First thing to say is that sadly Ian Bogus is not with us. I was hoping he was going to be distributed on the blockchain because we wanted to represent that but he's actually done something even more fashionable and caught COVID. So he's not with us because he's actually really not very well. Um, and he's so sorry that he can't be here. Puts a lot of pressure on me because Ian is such a smart thinker about that. So I'm not going to try and pretend to be him, but I'm going to try and channel some of his kind of smart questions about this. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the panel, but what I want them to do is uh, give fuller introductions to themselves. Uh, because I think that captures more about how they're interested, why they're interested in this field, and what their expertise and experiences are so far. So to my far left, we have Ray Soto, then we have my good friend Maria Bastille, so nice to see you, and Jano Kopanen. Um, and we're going to start with Jano. We're trying really kind of difficult things here, like using slides. I don't know if you've heard of that technology. Um, and Jano's kind of bravely uh, volunteered to go first. So off you go, Jano. And that's right. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here in person. My first time ever in Austin. Wow. And in this company. Uh, yeah, my name is Arno Koppanen. And I just traveled from Finland, from Helsinki. So I'm jet lagged. So if I don't make sense, it's not because of the topic, but it's because of the jet lag. So, okay. Next slide, please. What do I do in my work? What does a head of AI and personalization do? I try to combine journalism, data science, and design in order to create better tools for journalists in news investigations, but also in reporting, in telling the stories to people. Next slide, please. Some concrete things. So what my team has been doing. So, for example, we created a game, an educational game, about information operations. It's called Draw Factory. Fake news, hate speech, bot armies. You can experience everything firsthand in that game, so you can still play it. Second, news assistant Waito, my team, uh, created this first ever AI-powered news assistant that learns directly on your mobile lock screen. And then the last one, and this is something that I've been doing now, I've been building uh, and uh, leading the operations of the first ever AI and machine learning team, a journalistic machine learning team in Wiley News. So that's me. 
give you a bit of a more concrete uh, view on what I'm doing and, and what we are trying to achieve. Next slide, please. So what does this have to do with Web3 and, and Metaverse? I just wrote an article. This is my way to test my ideas. So I wrote an article uh, about the possibilities of these new emerging platforms. I don't give concrete answers, but some success, uh, successes. Uh, it's in, uh, on TechCrunch. You can go and read it if you will. But one thing, or, or two things, important things related to this. It seems that established news media doesn't make big bets on innovation at the moment. No launches or no new products for these emerging platforms. Okay. And, and what just Emily said previously, hey, are we missing something if we are not uh, taking an active part in developing for these new platforms? Next uh, slide, please. And I think that this is a moment of opportunity to use these new platforms, uh, Web3 and all it can entail, or Metaverse, VR, AR, in order to rethink what journalism can be, what it should be. And I give some suggestions in my, uh, in my article related to how could we rethink content? How could we rethink distribution? How could we potentially rethink uh, monetization and business models? Next slide, please. But it's not about technology. I want to be crystal clear. This is not something like uh, a current bet that it's going to work, that it will offer some kind of a silver bullet. No, of course not. But again, it gives us tools in order to explore what might come next. Next slide. Ah, uh, yes, we are there <laughs> already. Mind reading, next level technology. So it's about journalism. We cannot just say that these things are not happening. Web3 is happening. Blockchains and, uh, and cryptocurrencies, they are happening. They are already having an impact on our reality. So we as journalists, as news media, need to be able to recognize that and potentially become more active in shaping what those new emerging platforms and environments can mean to us and to people, to our customers and the users, uh, of news media. So next slide. So I have three questions that I'm thinking in relation to these new platforms. First, how do you build a journalistic organization for the future, for the next kind of stage uh, of internet, VR, metaverse, uh, transparent, decentralized sharing of information, uh, creating of information. Next slide, please. Second question. There's a war in Ukraine. I'm from Finland. We have 1,300 kilometers shared border with Russia. So it's been in my mind. But at the same time, we need to think that what's our process as a journalistic organization to tell what's happening in Ukraine when you can just open your TikTok and be there in the front line. How do we process? When you go to our news site, we are already behind. So how to create a future-proof uh, news organization? Next slide, please. And this is my last big question that I have in my mind today. Uh, obviously, I'm, I don't know the answers. I'm hoping to discuss with this great panel and with all of you today, like, uh, 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 what does it mean? But What's the next interface to information? Think metaverse. You are, you are not going to carry a rectangular thing <laughs> in there and take it uh, very like awkwardly as, a, as, a, as a, some kind of a virtual being, avatar. No. But at the same time, real-time information feeds, personalization. How could you do personalization with the journalism first way. How could these new emerging technologies where agency is now, for example, related to your data, the agency is moved from the company, from the organization to people? 
And then my very last slide. So I don't know answers to all of these questions, but I think, and this is something that I'm concretely doing, is to combine journalism, data science, and design in development, in, in development teams, but I also think that it's crucial to make that happen also in the leadership teams. The people understand this multidisciplinary way of seeing the world and its opportunities can happen. So that's me. It's great to be here. And I'm really looking forward to discuss about this topic with all of you today. Thank you so much. Jano, bring your microphone back because we're not going to, you're, you're not going to be let off by not speaking. Come, come back here, back here. No, that's yours. That's definitely yours. You have to bring it with you. Sorry. Sorry to be so bossy. It's just like, I can't. Yeah, no, no, exactly. It's like, I have to, I, I boss around men at home all the time. It's so great. Uh, sorry. <laughs> but thank you very much. That was great. Um, don't forget, post questions on the hashtag and through the magic of this amazing technology called a Google document, they will appear on my phone. Um, because uh, you're not allowed to apparently put your hands up anymore. That's another thing that's happening in this technical revolution. So Maria, uh, Maria Bostios, who uh, has so many kind of facets to her amazing career as a journalist, but is also, you know, a great thinker and experimenter on this, as well as a commentator. Um, and even though I know her biography incredibly well, she would be the perfect person to explain how she's ended up being a go-to uh, expert, I would say, on experimentation in some of these distributed technologies. And she's also going to tell us what she thinks. Um, because much to my surprise, Maria is a real fan. We usually agree about most things. Um, I'm not sure that we agree about this. So, Maria, take it away. Um, Don't forget to switch your mic, that mic was, on. Oh, it's on. Am I on? Yeah. OK. Hi, everybody. I'm Maria Bustillos. I'm a journalist and editor and uh, an information activist um, who has been interested in, in these questions for a really long time. Um, the first piece I ever wrote about Bitcoin uh, was in ex this very day, April Fool's Day of 2013 in The New Yorker. Uh, I had been interested in the technology, and my then editor, Matt Buchanan, at The New Yorker asked me, well, like, we're going to do a you know, this, it's all technology. We're gonna do this technology vertical. It's called Elements. What do you wanna write about? And I'm like, Bitcoin. And he's like, what? Really? You know? And I'm like, it's really interesting. It's like the money part of it isn't the interesting thing. Like, from the first minute that I started reading about blockchain technology, it struck me that the important aspect of it was the record keeping aspect of it. The money part of it didn't really interest me from the beginning, but um, I was fortunate enough to get to talk with Gavin Andreessen, who was the chief technology guy at Bitcoin early on, and, and asked him a lot of questions. I mean, as a journalist and a person whose work had been disappearing from the internet at like a remarkable rate, you know, as uh, outlets are acquired or, you know, they, they just, rot, you know, people stop keeping up, uh, they, databases disappear, machines break. And in the earlier days of the internet, this is happening at an incredible rate, you know, so much of the early internet disappeared. If it had not been for Brewster Kale, I don't even know what would, what would have happened to the early internet. He's like this one guy's vision um, kind of created a future, you know, for digital archiving. And this is also a topic of interest for me. So I've always been thinking about blockchain technology and what it can do for journalism, first and foremost, as an archival uh, sort of system. And um, it just so happens that I was uh, invited to participate in this thing called Civil, which was a blockchain-based publishing platform that was founded in 2017 by um, Consensus, basically, which is like the guys who who founded Ethereum, put up some money to do this. And you know, I don't know if you've ever heard this saying, like you know, the first pancake is for the dogs. Um, we were the first pancake and <laughs> of uh, journalism on the blockchain, and 
there were all kinds of regulatory problems and you know they kind of five million dollars kind of went down the tubes but we learned a lot and I haven't really changed my mind about a single thing that I went into that project thinking about what blockchain technology can do for persistence of publishing, what it can do for creating ways for readers and users to participate in a journalism economy, for journalists to be able to strengthen one another's work and uh, to like create communities in um, that are meaningful and long-lasting. And I've been working on that stuff ever since. Uh, most recently, um, I started a cooperative called the, the Brick House Cooperative. It was kind of the successor organization to Civil. Um, a bunch of the people who were publishing through Civil had created publications, and nine of us got together and were kind of doing this uh, novel form of ownership, this cooperative. And we were given a grant from Grant for the Web that was really exciting for us. And um, we're participating in an experiment over there to do with COIL. I urge anybody interested in this subject to look up Interledger and COIL. They're doing some really interesting things. Um, and what we did was an experiment during MozFest that was to do with microtipping. This is an area of huge interest for us. And basically what it amounts to, one of the things that uh, crypto tokens can do is to move very small amounts of value frictionlessly. Earlier attempts to do micro tipping, you know, in the early web, like flus and beans, some of you may remind, um, remember that kind of stuff. Um, Okay, we should talk about this later because I've just no, been sure. I was I'm gonna say I'm sure I chaired a panel which was what do beans mean for journalism, which is yes. panel, so it's, Yeah, so. I loved beans. Anyway, <laughs> that's that's what I've been up to and we'll talk more. Fantastic. And I just as I say, there's a pattern. We've really thought about this panel very carefully. So you know, we have European public media, we have genuinely independent genuinely independent media. And we also, I'm sorry, Ray, we have American corporate media in, in, in Gannett, where Ray is head of emerging technologies. Um, that does not mean that he's the person who comes and installs the fax machine at Gannett. Obviously, sorry, that's a bad joke, but Gannett and technology. Actually, Gannett have been leaders in newsroom technology, which is a little known fact. But Ray, if you want to, if you want to take it away and uh, take to the podium, we've We've successfully gone through one set of slides. I'm sure we can manage another. We'll, we'll make this work. Um, so, uh, you know, as a way to introduce myself, I thought it'd be funny to share a little story. Uh, seven years ago, ISOJ had invited me to talk about VR storytelling at USA Today. And full oh, transparency. Ray, we can't quite hear. Is it on? Do you want to hold it, it a bit closer hello, or hello. is it? Can folks hear me? Yes, there we, we go. Can there we go. That's great. So to uh, take a step back, seven years ago, I had the opportunity to present at ISOJ uh, to talk on the topic of VR storytelling at USA Today. Full transparency, I had never done any public speaking engagement ever. I don't think I did even touched a PowerPoint deck presentation that software. I was so nervous that I scripted out my entire speech and memorized it word for word, which is the worst thing anyone could ever do especially when my manager at the time threw a curveball and asked me to talk about something else. So for those of you who had watched my first presentation, thank you for being so patient with me. Uh, and I'm excited to share with all of you what we've been up to in the past seven years. So my name is Ray Soto, and I'm the Senior Director of Emerging Tech. Uh, my background is pretty interesting. It's not a uh, you know, traditional journalism background, but I'm a former video game developer. Uh, I was an art director. Uh, and I've worked with, you know, on, on several different, uh, you know, amazing IPs, but essentially what gravitated me towards journalism is that opportunity to tell stories, stories with a purpose, and I think that is a great kind of thing to highlight as uh, we had learned earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Well, there we go. So what I want to do is I want to start off by asking a question, and I want us to be honest. So this is a little bit of a class participation. I brought a prop, and I think you all have the same prop. If you can, please raise your mobile phone. So Yarno had, perfect. <laughs> so Yarno had proposed this question. What comes next? I hate to break it to all of you, but this is not the future of interface design, and we need to be thinking about journalism and uh, interacting with content beyond the screen. That when you consider that this device here has not essentially changed in the past you know, almost 15 years, 
yes, you have larger screens, yes, it's faster, you can do more with it, but there's a piece of technology embedded in there that's essentially telling us that um, things are changing and it's almost a breadcrumb of what we can expect next. And I'm talking about LiDAR. Next slide, please. But how are we leveraging LiDAR? I think what's really important for us to share is a little bit about our focus at USA Today uh, and as part of the emerging tech team. I'm very, very fortunate to lead a small uh, but mighty uh, team of innovators, uh, passionate storytellers. Uh, we love the challenges and kind of seeing where we can take this technology, not just as applied to storytelling, and I know that's kind of a theme throughout here, but how can we better prepare ourselves to ensure that we are a step ahead and at the same time evolve with the technology as it becomes more mainstream. So my team and I, as I mentioned, I am a former game developer, but so are they. We come from places like EA and Seasoft and even Disney Animation Studios. And we are also very, very fortunate to have a strong working relationship with traditional journalists to tell these stories through these formats. Next slide. Uh, previous one, please. So creating impact. Uh, for every story that we, we tackle, we want to make sure that we move beyond the gimmick. We understand that sometimes these one-off projects, it's an opportunity to learn, but over the past you know, seven years, uh, starting off with virtual reality, interactive, uh, immersive headset driven, to 360 degree video and now augmented reality, there's a seamless path of understanding spatial, uh, kind of spatial awareness, uh, how a user understands and uh, kind of drives that story forward. But there were four things that we ended up learning over the, pa over the past uh, few years. So these are our four tenets, essentially, that for every story that we tackle, we want to make sure that we hit all four of these. Obviously, visuals are very important. Uh, we want to ensure that folks understand what they're seeing, but at the same time, find value in what they're seeing. The second one for us is all about interactivity. You know, as former game developers, we know that interactive experiences help drive engagement, but at the same time, provides an opportunity for attention. What I mean by that is an opportunity for folks to explore and discover stories for themselves through interactivity. The third one, sound. Sound is so important, and I'm almost disappointed that we don't talk about it enough. That when you consider that uh, it's almost the other half, and with spatial audio uh, kind of refining and adding some of those audio elements, especially when there's a bit of a kind of feedback when a user interacts with something to help drive that story. And lastly, pacing. Pacing is really, really important for the types of stories that we develop in AR. What we learned in VR, as I mentioned, can be applied but we can't create these long interactive AR experiences that go on for 10 minutes. Our sweet spot has been about three minutes, and we try to adhere to that very, very strongly, especially when we consider all four of these pillars. Next slide, please. So how do we do all that? For us, uh, you know, we evaluated several different platforms and several different technologies, but for us, the Unity game development platform is what gets us to where we want to be. And you know, taking a look at those four, four tenets, uh, we want to make sure that we can display different types of medium, not just 3D, but also 2D. Can we surface interactive photos and videos, you know, content annotations? It's very, very important for us to be able to use all of that to be able to leverage the power of AR through, uh, through those types of experiences. User interaction. Uh, we want to ensure that what we end up creating, since it is a mobile device, uh, that folks understand there's almost this uh, kind of interaction uh, kind of dictionary that folks can already understand. It's one of the things that we want to ensure that folks already uh, know what's happening and are familiar with what it is that we're providing through that screen interaction uh, in that interface. But lastly, accessibility is really, really important for us. What we want to do is we want to move beyond just uh, that one you know, hit gimmick, but also being able to distribute this content from local to national across all of our local markets to reach all of our communities with stories that matter to them. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, you know, we do have that integrated across all of our native apps, and it provides us that opportunity to distribute this content and reach them where they are at. Next slide. So a challenging pivot. I, I think it's really important that we have to, you know, we're all talking about you know, the pandemic. For us, it was really interesting how we were you know, working within the same room. We love brainstorming. We love whiteboarding. But once the pandemic hit, we had to shift over to a full remote uh, kind of work environment. So kind of evaluating our processes and what's available to us, what we ended up doing is focusing on COVID-related content. And next slide, please. Uh, one more. What we ended up noticing is something very, very interesting when you think about audience engagement and trends. That our first two projects in the pandemic, which were COVID-related, 
worked and they stuck, specifically when you look at some of these engagement numbers, which completely surprised us. I think what's most impressive is that 7.6 million impressions. Now, we consider those two pro the two projects that were showcased before uh, developed within five days, uh, kind of top of mind. Uh, you know, folks were really interested in learning more about the CDC guidelines on an interactive game experience, but at the same time, some of the visuals. That told us that uh, you know, we're, we're onto something and we can make this work. Next slide, please. But through all that, we also noticed that there was an opportunity to uh, kind of enhance the user experience. We noticed that uh, there was a steep drop off from the impressions to actual folks engaging and interacting with the story. So we did a user test, uh, and this was actually last summer. What we ended up learning was fascinating. I think it's something that we could all learn from. That I'd say about 80% of our users who had tested our existing uh, augmented reality experiences, which are on the far left side, uh, they had never heard of the term augmented reality. They understood what the technology is. They could talk about it based on filters. So we found an opportunity to make things a bit more conversational when it comes to the user experience design. And what we ended up creating is what you see on the left here. Folks are able to immediately understand why is it that we're asking for camera access? Where are you going to project uh, these stories? How do I interact with it? And it provided a steep, steep increase when it came to user engagement and average time spent. What we saw around 120 seconds uh, per uh, average time spent per user is now above three minutes. We've seen as high as five and even in some cases 10 minutes depending on the story and that's been phenomenal for us. Next slide please. So I wanted to uh, share this particular story, and this is the one that I'm most proud of, and it was the last one that we published uh, last year. Uh, Seven Days of 1961, A Dangerous Ride on the Road to Freedom, uh, is a story in which users can step up to a, the Greyhound bus uh, that the Freedom Riders had uh, ridden to Anderson, Alabama, and in which their, their bus was attacked. But if you look at all those different pillars that I had mentioned before, interactivity, pacing, and sound, you'll see each of those uh, carried out throughout this. Uh, let's see if the video play. I don't think audio is playing, but essentially uh, <laughs> I'm encouraging folks to check it out. You can find it within the USA Today app. Next slide, please. So what have we learned? Uh, quite a bit. In the past seven years, you know, we provide value. We're reaching a broad audience and we're driving repeat visits. Our audiences are understanding what this technology is. They find value in this, and it's fantastic to see that they are seeking this type of content. Next slide, please. So our advice to you, build a cross-divisional workflow. This is very, very important. You know, as former game developers and technologists, uh, early on we were learning how to tell better stories uh, you know, through this platform, but working very closely with traditional reporters. Uh, you know, understanding the story, being transparent, updating often, I think is one of the biggest things, where you have to be uh, comfortable with experimenting, but also being transparent in the sense of this is not working, we should shift from there. And the last one, you have to evolve with the technology uh, and the audience. So going back to uh, the question I proposed, what does come next? Next slide. The future of journalism is immersive, interactive, and 3D. So please think about that as we continue this conversation. Uh, and I'm excited to share some of those details with you all later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ray. Um, I just want to point out that actually Yano was right about the microphone, and I was wrong. Um, but what's very pleasing about that is that he did what I said anyway. So, um, so I, I sort of want to start on that last point, Ray, where you say the future of journalism is interactive, immersive. You know, you're looking at it from, as it were, a sort of a, a user, exp user experience point of view. Um, so before I worked at uh, Columbia University for 10 years, I ran the web um, operations at The Guardian, where we introduced lots and lots and lots of new things. And we did it because we had this, that, I mean, sometimes because we genuinely thought podcasting is the future of journalism. And we thought that in 2005, and for six months it was, and then for 10 years it wasn't. Um, and And... And we, we, we had this sort of thing where we would say, you know, there is a curve of enthusiasm and ignorance. And at the top of that curve, you know, news organizations, to be brutally honest about it, can make money. And actually, <laughs> and actually one thing that always struck me was how, so this is where I'm now channeling it in, in, Bo, in Bogost, which is some of this is also about how newsrooms adopt technologies and what they see that role as being. Like, is this about our societal impact? <laughs> is it 
about our business model? Is it about some kind of civic mission? So I just want to, it feels like a big question to start off with, but when you say the future of journalism is da 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 da, you think maybe in a commercial sort of sphere, and, and, and you know, it, can we, can we, should we be tying the future of journalism to those kinds of technologies, to that kind of interaction? And because you just talked about it, I'm not going to come to you first. But I was just sort of going to ask Maria what you think, because you, again, you've covered this. Like, what does this tell us about how newsrooms adopt these technologies and what the history of our adoption sort of tells us about this present moment? I think what, um, you're on. Okay. I think. Uh, when people say Web3, they mean a lot of different things and they should mean a lot of different things. It's like when we say the internet, right? There's the internet of Brewster Kale and Wikimedia, and then there's the internet of Google, you know, and these like really ex ex exploitive uh, platforms. And what these Web3 technologies are going to enable for journalism is similarly double-edged like you know people ask me is this is this a good thing or a bad and i always say is a knife bad or good yes definitely mm -hmm. and very bad and very good depending right and we're facing the situation where these things are so poorly understood what it can do and it's this sort of nascent explosion of possibilities that it's hard to answer that question in one way i think one thing that's going to happen is these technologies are going to use to exploit, be used to exploit people. We're already seeing that. Um, but like what I've been trying to do for the last five years is to make make the good part of the knife happen. And so, what that means to me is uh, newsrooms can adopt the idea of ownership. Uh, you know that people what NFTs are, for example, is a way of giving people. Uh, a stake, personal stake in something that's happening. One thing that you can do is get people to contribute to funding a story or buying a camera or like here is an, a foreign correspondent, you know, that you can participate in that person's career. You can comment, you can give money. And I think these things are very fruitful. They have a very, very positive uh, like feedback that we've gotten so far with it. But instantiating it is another thing. Yes, I totally agree. And uh, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, what I also already mentioned is that if journalists and news media is not defining the use cases and business cases, you know, then like I said, that uh, what is internet? Like we, we know how it can be used or, or what is Web3? Like it has like a lot of issues. Uh, but then again, uh, we need to see it as an opportunity uh, to kind of re reflect what we want the world to look like from the journalistic mission uh, point of view. And at the same time, it's also a business, like right. you said. Monetization, business, hard, hard topics. But that goes back to what Ray just uh, presented. How are you gonna ha going to have a sustainable business if you cannot engage anymore? with people. You go creating, uh, trying to figure out what are the use cases and business cases, but on top of that, you need to use design and, and user research in order to know how people truly want to experience journalism and journalistic content. I don't know, like... Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we need to consider is what are their expectations as well. You know, when we're talking about different platforms now, whether it's TikTok, uh, you know, we think about, you know, Instagram filters, uh, and I'm specifically talking about AR at this point. Um, what are some of those expectations when they come to our platform? So let's say as an example, you know, if they come to uh, download the USA Today uh, app and interact with it, you know, we hope to surprise them that we do have AR content. But it goes beyond that, you know, with some of the different technologies that we're talking about, whether it's NFTs, you know, the web, three and the future of the metaverse, we have to start thinking about, well, how do we go to where these audiences are going to be? And at the same time, how do we create our uh, interactive experiences, but at the same time, create a platform that is part of the, the, the future of the metaverse? Uh, there are a lot of things that we are, are looking at, but it's really going to be guided not just by the technology, and I quickly highlighted because I ran out of time, but 
we have to evolve with the technology and more importantly with the audience and their expectations. There's a, there's a question actually which um, uh, Sarah Sear has asked about uh, you know how does accessibility play into that and that actually kind of that snags a question that was you know really in my mind as well so I don't know who's had uh, time to uh, read the 14,000 word piece by Kevin Ruse uh, that came out in the New York Times I think about a week ago, uh, 10 days ago, which was about, you know, kind of the, the beginner's guide to crypto. I posted on Twitter this morning that you should read that and maybe also read the Molly White uh, blog post where she's got skeptics uh, to annotate, which is called the edited guide to beginner's guide to crypto. Um, I know you're all there. There was a slight kind of like chill when I said, I don't know if anyone's had time to read the 14,000 words article in the New York Times. Just reminds me of an old editor of mine who said nobody ever got fired for printing fewer words. Um, that's a note for Kevin Ruse. But, but in that, there, you know, the, the debate there is, is this one about accessibility. It's about like, what are the mistakes we make? Kevin Ruse said, nobody asked like the hard questions about Facebook in 2009, which is just completely untrue. There were lots of people asking the hard questions about what is the impact of this going to be? What is your lack of regulation around this technology really going to mean to people? But they were just ignored because the tidal bore of the money coming into the, the, the sort of the, 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 the creation of these technologies weighed very much against it. And I think that's a question about accessibility goes to a much wider question about inclusion and adoption of technologies. And sort of what, you know, how, how should we think about that right at the beginning of this, or halfway through it, given that it started in 2013, as opposed to waiting till it's too late. We talked about um, inclusion uh, a, a lot when we were in the civil uh, project, Indeed. which I which I was also briefly part of the dog bound pancake. Yeah. So yes. Oh my God! <laughs> it was people. Uh, were forced to jump through so many hoops to get a right. Coinbase account. Right. Just it, it was just impossible, you know, and, and the regulations, the sort of regulatory atmosphere became more and more restrictive as the project sort of moved forward. There are, because largely there are entrenched interests that are opposed to uh, these technologies moving forward and their power being diminished. So we have a big problem with that. And the other problem is, there's a tidal wave of money, but it's not coming from people who are really interested in journalism or interested in creating a healthy information economy, where there's so much instantaneous wealth up for grabs. It has kind of warped the way that this, this whole thing is proceeding. But at the same time, the technology is there to be used to improve our industry, and we can just do that. And so some, that's what some of us are trying to do. Yeah, maybe maybe one thing to add on this is the uh, when you mentioned Facebook, for example, uh, and social media, did we truly understand the dynamics that would emerge in these new platforms and environments? Like I, I would say that no, we didn't. You know, the, the idea of Facebook really like connecting with people, friends, great. Uh, so again, now with the VR, with the metaverse, with the Web3, are we going to be able to understand as an East media the dynamics that are going to be shaping not just the future of the internet and, and our digital realities, but the physical reality as well? Because, you know, how can you tell them apart? So that's what I'm thinking, that if we are not there experimenting and, and, and trying to shape these new environments, we are going to left out when these new dynamics emerge. And of course, no one can truly predict what they might be. Uh, I'd say that no one could truly predict what social media uh, would do, for example, like fake news. It was discussed earlier today. First, something uh, of a kind of a, just a, a word used for certain kind of a content, but now actually becoming a tool that you can use against democracy, against free journalism, uh, against critical voices. So who could have predicted that? Well, quite a lot of people did predict. I mean, sorry, but the, but but it's but it's but you see that is a great question, which is 
lots of people who are experts in this area, lots of academics, mostly academics and journalists, actually, who were not financially incentivized to see other things, were like, if you introduce this technology without thinking about civil society impacts, you will end up exactly where we've ended up. And actually, we've probably ended up in a far worse place than many people predicted even, even back then. And I, and I think, that, so, so sorry, I'm not just sort of challenging that, I'm just saying, it, are there things that we need to learn, particularly about our role as journalists who want civic impact, about the process of that adoption? I'm gonna come back to Ray in a minute, but yeah, Maria, on. We gotta be a lot louder, a lot, a lot louder with the public and tell them there are risks and there are rewards and you have to listen, it's subtle. It's not like NFTs are dumb, you know, it's like it's not, NFTs is not apes and people. NFTs is a whole world of ways where people can connect with the sources of their information and participate in that. And like we just have to demonstrate and right. be very noisy. Yeah, so it sort of raises a question for Ray about how you introduce these technologies and how you talk about them. We've all seen the non-fungible token that you could participate in buying part of an op-ed in the New York Times. I mean, why anyone would want to do that, I don't know. Um, you can, you know, the AP have actually kind of rolled it out. And again, you know, I spent a lot of my career thinking about the application of technologies into journalism. I like, oh, you can buy, like, you can participate in the, in the photo kind of archive of the AP. But I don't get, like, a lovely print for my wall, it's like, what, do I, what is it that I've got? So I'm just wondering, like, when, when you're introducing these technologies, has, how does your department think about those questions of accessibility, of, you know, yes, we have to monetize it, but also, if this has an impact in the, in the world, what do we want it to be beyond the, beyond the kind of engagement metrics, if you like? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I want to uh, kind of take a step back and it, it echoes uh, what's been shared already is we have to be transparent. And what I mean by that is being transparent in the sense of, no, we don't know where exactly this is going. We can make some predictions, but our audiences value that. When we're saying, look, we're, we're figuring this out, we're working with you, and at the same time, we just have to be a part of those conversations with big tech and, and some of these other, uh, you know, technology tools and platforms to help build that up. But uh, you know, when it goes to accessibility, we, we look at it from several different aspects. Um, one of the things very early on uh, that we've done is we want to make sure that folks um, who might have some uh, hearing disabilities, uh, we have closed captions in every interactive story that we create. Uh, at the same time, knowing that augmented reality is a location-based experience, we also want to make sure that folks who might have some uh, mobility uh, you know issues and on from there that they can still access this and don't feel as if they have to stand up and walk way across the room to be able to interact with the story. So from that aspect, you know, we are very cognizant of the fact that we, we want this to be accessible to, to as many people as possible. But at the same time, it's really important for us to make the entire user experience as seamless as possible. We don't want folks to feel as if they have to jump through hoops to be able to access something. And as soon as they fire it up, they don't know what to expect and they're almost lost. So we're almost building this with them, in a sense, where we can you know, experiment with something small, uh, be transparent with some of the results, and you know, our team, we're very transparent on what's worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, but at the same time, though, it becomes one of those things where we have to ensure that we are growing with them. And I know it just goes back to what I had said before, you know, evolve with the technology and evolve with the audience and their expectation. I think that's really, really important. I have something to add about this. Um, everybody is more familiar with it than they think. Like in an earlier life, I was an antiquarian bookseller and sold a lot of first editions. And people will pay a lot for, you know, you can get a copy of Ulysses for a dollar in a thrift shop. Or if you get a first edition, even if it's not signed, it's worth a lot more money. It's the same words in the same order. But people want a sense of participation in, in the thing. And that's really like, you know, the NFT side of this thing that's to do with collecting art and things like that. or uh, to me, it's sort of like ticket stubs. You know, I've got like a big collection of ticket stubs from rock shows that I went to when I was a kid. And they're just little torn pieces of paper, but they have a significance that is very powerful to the people who are interested in that. 
And that's kind of what the whole NFT thing is about. And I think it will be possible to own, right. you know, participation in journalism. But is it but is it phony participation? So I, you know, kind of so so that again is sort of something that sort of I think about without wanting to go all art in the age of mechanical reproduction about it. That sort of idea that um, Walter Benjamin had of you know kind of like you 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 disrupt the aura of a painting in. Um, you know, the Musée d'Orsay or wherever, because it can be hang on everybody's wall. And actually what happened was you just increased the aura and the value of the physical thing. This is and, the same. And, and, but, but, but it's not a physical thing. So I don't want to, but, so I'm being, you know, you, you, you're, you're asking people to participate in something which is illegible to them on a, on a fundamental level, I think. So... Two things. It's possible yeah. to connect these things to physical objects. Um, it's possible to have an NFT that's connected to a thing. Um, but the second thing is, it's almost more permanent and more significant than an original painting because anybody in the world can go and look at the records of a publicly distributed blockchain and see what happened. It's like there's an immutable unchangeable record that you made this happen. You are the participant, you're the person. And you can, That's I, to me that's better than something you can put on the wall. I don't collect NFTs and I'm not a cheerleader for this, but I understand it for sure. Yeah, um, I'm getting philosophical here maybe, uh, because there have been so so inspiring thoughts and, 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 uh, and insights. And I'm, uh, the question that comes to my mind now is that, like, are we taking the, the value of journalism sometimes for granted? That that we think that you know we create something so important that it has to have a place in people's lives, and it goes a bit uh, to this social media thing that we discussed earlier. Like, what is the place of uh, truthful information in people's lives? Uh, and if you think about uh, social media today, journalism today, it's not just that facts are against facts, but facts against any explanation that gets enough uh, uh, attention. And in that game, uh, I'd say that uh, journalism hasn't been proactive when we've seen certain patterns leading to an information ecosystem where facts and fictions uh, are treated in a, in, in, in a you, you kind of compare these apples and oranges. So we live in this reality and then what you just mentioned, this transparency that you can go in a decentralized system to see w what's happening with the information. So I'm thinking that isn't that uh, offering kind of a laboratory also for seeing if these uh, these new possibilities could bring again um, exactly yeah to contextualize you know we so often the or the slaves of the twenty four hour uh, sort of news cycle this has the opportunity it offers opportunities for change for that when you can like mark this existed then this is what was said it is immutably said you can go back and look. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean now that we know all these other new things? And this is, I mean, there's a question from Liz Dwyer, which really gets mu in much more better articulated way to the thing that I was kind of probing at before. And she says, you know, if we know that the growing local news audience of uh, people of color is usually not included or considered in the adoption of tech, how are we ensuring that Web3, et cetera, uh, actually serves this audience? And, and given the lack of representation, um, in those creation teams, you know, how can we ensure that we just aren't replicating, you know, exclusion, anti-blackness, etc., in our reporting in these spaces? And it's, so, so this to me seems like like absolutely fundamental question for us, which is, for way too long, um, innovation in newsrooms was focused only on product and technology in one dimension, and we got it so wrong. 
And I think there are still people who get it wrong when they go, newsrooms aren't kind of fast enough. They're not enough like tech companies. It's not the point. We missed it. So, sorry, Ray, I'm going to come back to you on that. So, so how is that something? Because I think, you know, the games industry has been through exactly these debates. And, you know, kind of it's interesting to see diversity sort of, you know, kind of, in some ways, the game space is a, is a really great example, both of the good part of the knife and the bad part of the knife. So I'm just, just how do you do that? You, you have local outlets. You're addressing communities that have been excluded by different types of corporate media in the past. Yeah, I think the, what you had shared with the games industry having been through this, um, they are still going through it. And uh, it's one of those things where our team and the way that we evaluate these technologies and what it is that we're looking to build um, can learn what not to do. <laughs> and at the same time, it is really, really important for us to be able to uh, include diverse uh, voices in all of our projects. Uh, if you were to look at our catalog of content, you'll see it, it's pretty diverse from, uh, you know, a really great example, uh, the team over at, at uh, the Courier Journal reached out to us and said, we want to do a story on Breonna Taylor. Uh, we interviewed several different women uh, throughout the community and, and they submitted audio recordings of uh, how her death has, has impacted them. So we created a story around that, working very closely with you know, uh, folks uh, of color in at the Louisville, Kentucky uh, area. So essentially for us, it, it's these different types of stories. We want to ensure that we're working with the right people to include those voices at the same time to ensure that these stories which are going to these communities resonate with them so they don't feel as if it's just us telling, presenting something. It's more along the lines of like, look, you're a part of this. And it's also, but it has to be at the creation level, right, as well. It has to be actually at the, and that's something which, I mean, it's interesting. To what extent is that actually completely beyond our control already? You know, that, that actually the fundamental underlying technologies are, are already co-opted by a corporate world. So much as we talk about decentralization, it's not really decentralized at all. I'm just kind of wondering whether we have to kind of, if you'd like, sort of bring that in at story level, or if there is more we can do around shaping the technologies. And that's one for Jana as well, because you have a public mission in this too, I think. So. You, you know, just from, from a very high level, um, yeah, absolutely. This needs to go beyond just, you know, the stories. We have to have these conversations with these different uh, companies and these different tools and platforms. Uh, you know, when you consider the USA Today network as a whole, very, very diverse. You know, we've got the local to national side of things. And I know it's not just unique to us. So as we're having these conversations uh, you know, with these different, you know, with big tech as an example, uh, we ask those very important questions. You know, how can uh, not only we be a part of this, but our audiences can be a part of this, and especially with the diverse reporting that we have as well. We can create technologies that bring readers in more. And like when I think about this stuff and think about comments and like how right. did these, how did the progress that has been made on diversity even happen? It mm -hmm. continued to happen more and more as readers. The pressure comes from readers. Like when you go to the New York Times and they've got the most amazing comment system, right. they've developed it over time. There's reader picks, you know, and then there's the editor's picks. And so you get a broad range of responses from a diverse audiences who demand mm -hmm. inclusion. And we can make Web3 enhance that by about a million. I mean, that's a really interesting example with commenting, right? So we were the first to implement commenting on news articles at The Guardian way back when, when we thought it was going to be the future of journalism. And, and we were really committed to it because we're, you know, we, we don't have to make a profit in the same way that other organizations do because we saw it as part of our social mission and we went with, but even then we went with six apart. And then as we were developing our own comment systems, and you know, you're talking about the New York Times, the number of organizations that have actually stuck to that and understood that moderation and inclusion is actually not cheap, it's costly, and have had the ability to build those tools in their own newsrooms is really small. And everything else has been outsourced. Uh, anyone who's kept comments has outsourced it to Facebook, which has been, to my mind, a complete disaster. But that's that's just because it's not it's not the right the right kind of inclusion. I, I so I so I'm kind of this I know this is like this more is peanuts, aside, but but um, blockchain solves this like just boom like that. It solves scalping. You can you can create smart contracts that forbid exploitation of the kind that you're talking about. For instance, by charging a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of money to make a comment, it then becomes very difficult to make bots that, you know, right. and if you can 
tip comments. You can like empower people that are writing. You know, there, there's so, and we're just barely scratching the surface of this, so right. it's possible Sorry, to Jill. improve. Sorry. Yeah, maybe maybe uh, add on the methodology, for example, which is discussed earlier about multidisciplinary approach, and I think that's needed for inclusion, like design methods, some of the design methods that you can use actually take that uh, stance, like they help you to understand who are you actually serving and who are you are, are not serving. And the same applies to data science and, and, and data. If you can combine journalism, uh, data science and design as, as a methodology in order to approach this very, like, it's a hard question, like, it, it, say, these big tech companies, they are not doing <laughs> very, very good work, even though what kind of resources they have, we all know. So then we need to be very wise in trying to understand what are the points of kind of, uh, that way we can have an impact. Uh, and, and they're the right set of tools, right set of methodologies can help uh, to recognize these uh, things that we can do better in the future. There's a, there's a kind of bunch of questions here which are broadly uh, gr all groups around the idea of veracity. So um, Elsie uh, Bariota and Christina, hey Christina, uh, Todd Aguila and uh, somebody else, sorry because my, um, my scrolling is up. I'm going to try and kind of just compress those questions. So there's several in here which is First of all, Christina says, you know, actually, uh, some fact checkers have been ahead of the curve. They've already been selling NFTs and kind of fact checks, etc. But people don't want to buy. Like, there's a there's that lag again. You can get everything right, and if the market is not ready, it it kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, so you can be right ahead of time. And how long? And and what do we think that timeline is? And then something else about you know, kind of that that veracity uh, and how you establish. Um, veracity of news in, in, in technology j journalism and, and how much more of a challenge that is. And I think, you know, I have so many feelings about truth, fact checking, what's real, veracity, how we represent that and how we kind of make that central to our mission when perhaps, you know, yes, of course it's central to our mission, but perhaps it's the way we're going about it is not quite the right way. So I don't know who wants to tackle the sort of the, the, those really sort of practical good questions, but also the more kind of philosophical, philosophical question, which is how is how is this going to change that? Because it's, it's not the blockchain, right? Because you can authenticate something on the blockchain, but you can authenticate anything. It doesn't have to be true. To author, you know what I mean? Which is like people, people well, can put shit on the blockchain as well as they can put shit on the internet. Yeah, but you know that they did it, right? You, the, and they you, they can't undo it. It's a, there's, there's this one right. thing about it that you just can't, you cannot the, unstir the jam out of the porridge. But they do that anyway. And so, so like nobody, like everybody's owning, like the big lie is owned and it's out there and it's not kind of about kind of masking sort of uh, uh, anonymity. You know, it's not like, you know, I, I don't know. That's, that's one of my remember, thoughts about it. Remember there was a big scandal um, when they found Barack Obama's uh, birth notice in the State Library in Honolulu. It was on a microfiche. Mm -hmm. And if that thing had not been there, it would have been much, much easier for the right. birther movement to do their thing. It was very difficult or impossible to falsify that piece of plastic. And that's what this is. It, right. it can be used intelligently or not, you know, and this is what we're here to hope that it is used intelligently. But all that it does is keeps uh, inalterable records and what we are to make of that it remains to be seen I agree like you know we've made a mistake trying to tell the public that truth is a thing that can be known you know that objectivity is a thing that can happen instead of telling people that that truth evolves you know that like right. people learn things and this is a great tool for that if we do it right mm -hmm. and also uh you know, what's the future of fact-checking? Like I just mentioned that facts and fiction uh, all the same. But I go back to Ray uh, and, and, and think that can fact-checking be fun? You know, can it be something that is actually that in some future environment that you can do it just by like almost um, by doing nothing? Uh, I don't know what it means truly, like to be honest. But engaging way to interact with information that also includes some kind of a mechanism 
for verification. And there you could tie it into to Web3, like if there is a maturity or a recognized parties verifying something like almost magically. Uh, okay, I used word magic, just sorry about that. But what about something like that, like engaging uh, experience, uh, bringing people almost, almost sorry in, in making sure that the information or the reality that we share is something that we actually share. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's 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 one of those things where I feel like audiences are looking forward to being able to interact um, with this type of content in a new way, especially when it's verified. And I think there's, you know, obviously uh, several different themes that we're we're covering here, uh, but we do have to kind of think ahead as far as how do we create those types of experiences in which, when folks interact with it, they know it is trusted, it is verified, and at the same time, um, you know, one of the things that we have to consider is we don't want to take that opportunity for granted either, which is why we're having this conversation uh, where you know, you've been working in this since 2013, which is mm. amazing. What can we learn and adapt you know, moving forward? And at the same time, uh, you know, as we're talking about you know, the methodology of you know, uh, design, that absolutely needs to change. It is so, so important. How do we communicate what these technologies are? I mean, you could tell that we're uh, coming at this from different perspectives, but there's still that common thread across all of them. So what can we do, let's say, after this conversation here to be able to continue to build up and grow, especially in our industry, but as the audiences are going to start seeking this type of content. Um, you know, one of the things that does excite me is, you know, from the NFT side of things, that verification. Um, when we're talking about um, also providing value, uh, the utility as well. Um, I forgot someone had mentioned, uh, Emily, I think you had mentioned, you know, who would want to own a fact check uh, of an NFT. But no, 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 that was, that was who would want to own part of an op-ed of the New York that, Times. <laughs> very different. <laughs> very different. Very different. So. But yes, principally but, the same thing. But we need to start thinking about um, what is the utility there? You know, how can we uh, treat folks who are willing to fund journalism, not as subscribers, but almost as members, at the same time to have that be a, a, not just a part of the conversation, but feeling as if, Yes, I trust this source. I was a part of this. I'm helping fund this, and I'm excited to see what might be coming up next. This is, again, another question which um, uh, Maria's posed this, but there are a couple of uh, others I'm sort of going to round up about just introducing into markets and communities that actually don't have access to these kinds of tools or where I remember doing a conference where um, we were talking about ad blockers, and it was to a, a general audience in a, in a local town from where I come from in the UK, which is a really like not wealthy part of the country. And uh, the people I was on the panel with were really amazed that so many people in the audience, had, and these are like journalists, had had ad blockers on their phones. And I was like, it's because the data plan is so expensive if you don't put an ad blocker on it. And, and, and I think that that, again, sort of we come from this position of introducing technologies into communities that might use them in very different ways because they're coming from de very different positions, but also m might just not have the economic educational empowerment at the moment to make use of those. You know, what, what's, what are our thoughts about that? Is that a sort of something where it doesn't matter if we introduce technologies which are not generally available to absolutely everybody. What happened when people, the first time you heard you're going to have a computer in your pocket, you were just like, no. Not going to happen. I don't know. <laughs> not my mom won't do that. But when it became a thing when my mom could get pictures of her grandchildren on Instagram, right. dude yeah. was unstoppable. Yeah. She was getting, the, she learned how to, the no learning curve was too steep. Right. And, and so I think this is the same. Right. But that's a use case that we did not come up with in journalism. So again, like we have to think of those use cases, it seems to me, much more carefully. I think you're wrong about who wants to own the, the New York Times thing because like, I uh, recorded myself a, um, uh, when Me Too happened, yeah. the first person to write about it was Tom Skoka at Gawker mm -hmm. by this weird chance he is writing about mm -hmm. the um, the Woody Allen scandal and he had pointed out that Bill Cosby was a similarly loved uh, personality whose uh, sexual peccadillos or whatever had been buried 
in like 2012 or something like that. And it was from there that the thing snowballed. And his role in sort of bringing this up disappeared. So the first time I had a chance to archive something on the blockchain, I chose that. He's a, right. he's a colleague. And I made a permanent record of it. I'm, I'm totally making a qualitative judgment about what I know of the New York Times op-ed page. And just saying <laughs> I would not necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily want to own some of that. Just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> not not reflection on the principles, just on the actual application of equality. This is cruel. It's, it's very cruel. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you know what the New York Times op-ed page can um, can uh, can look after themselves? Yeah. We're, get, we're getting the we're getting the minute um, sign up. We've had some great questions. There's one here that from Damon that sort of goes back to um, kind of where, where we started in a way. And so I'm just going to kind of ask this, and if you can just sum up your thoughts about this. So Damon says. Um, Technology can be used for good by newsrooms and communities. Good part of the knife, bad part of the knife. But can those interpretations prevail when the power of implementation lies with multi-billion dollar corporations driven only by profit motives? And I know that's where we started, but I think it's such a big question that it's really worth going back to. I'm going to start with you, Jano, because you're in, if you like, a competing system to that, which is public media. Uh, we don't know so much about that in the United States, but just it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on whether we can whether whether it is a lost cause already yeah maybe if i understood it correctly um uh the, the question but i think what we've discussed here uh, in general is the agency who has the agency to affect these technologies or new interfaces or experiences and i think there is a seed of opportunity with both web3 and with the metaverse that if done in the right way, if done uh, with the right values, the agency sifts from big corporations to citizens to people. And uh, I'd like to see that happen. But, uh, you know, we are, we are on a journey here. Maria, I know you're not, not a fan of the billion dollar corporation. <laughs> well, um, no. <laughs> But uh, yes, we live in a really corrupt world, more corrupt than I gave it credit for. And being part of this industry has been an education. But like, at the same time, independent voices are not being stifled. And it, it can only uh, get better, I think. The tools are improving, and we have to keep fighting. And it's going to get better, I think. Ray, speaking of somebody from a multi-billion corporation that is Gannett News, <laughs> How do you see your role in this? <laughs> what really excites us uh, is when I look at the landscape of the promise of Web3 and the metaverse as decentralized um, I, and interoperability, and I think that that's key. Uh, we recognize that it's really important for us to not only have a relationship to understand where some of these technologies might go, but also look forward in the sense of how can we create content and experiences that can reach everyone. You know, when you think about Web AR as an example, and the advancements that are happening as part of Web3 and on from there, we are going to be learning from our audiences and how they're engaged. So the example of ad blockers, um, you know, communities in which uh, you know they might not have access to these, you know, thousands of dollars uh, worth of devices and on from there. Well, how are they interacting with technology now? They are the ones that are going to guide the future of Web3 and the metaverse, and we have to be able to follow them and leverage them uh, to to inform us in the direction that we should be thinking. That's a great note on which to end. Um, I could honestly stay here and talk about it all day, but apparently we're not allowed to. Um, thank you so much uh, to the brilliant panel, Ray, Maria, uh, 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 Jarno. Um, do you catch up with any of the panelists? Because um, I'm sure that I'm particularly Maria would like to talk to you if you're interested in the whole kind of uh, cooperative media startups. And thank you very much indeed for amazing questions. That's great, and working technology. Thank you. Thank you.